Dave Green and Claire Moore. Welcome to Australian Musician again. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Uh, Zipper Dee Doo. Uh, what is? Was that? This is the new album. Um, was it a bunch of songs you had available? Uh, was it just time to make an album? How did this album come about? The title, Zippity Do, What Is, Was That, this comes from a song we did, Song of Life, and it's one that Claire and I did. Our last album, Let's Get Tight, was really song-based, and a lot of it was just me and Claire uh, building the tracks up in our studio and, uh, and concentrating on songs, and we continued that uh, past it, uh, and like we did uh, 12 or 13 songs on Let's Get Tight and we just kept doing a song every month and let, and Song of Life uh, was was a continuation of that and then we started to play it live with our band um, Stu Thomas, our bass player, played on the recording, sorry, as well but uh, we started to play it live and of course songs with the band always get, they sound, uh, I don't know, more they bring more to it. Uh, the initial recording is on the album as well because that had qualities that, that we liked as well and uh, that was an approach to make an album of of different uh, versions of songs. So there's eight songs on the album but uh, there's 13 tracks, so eight songs done 13 ways. So uh, basically we wanted to do a album with our band and that, that's the main approach of it, yeah. Um, <clears throat> when you bring the songs to the band, uh, is there a brief or is it just up to them to do their thing? Yeah, uh, well, there's two uh, songs on this that are credited with the music to, you know, everybody's got a songwriting credit because uh, everybody brought so much to it. There's Ultra Keef, which um, me and Claire kind of demoed it, you know, but all it was was they... Uh, a ca like a cowbell, <laughs> cowbell. Beat, cowbell beat and uh, just block chords in a in a kind of particular way because uh, it's it's a song steeped in Rolling Stones kind of mythology and then we brought it to Stu uh, Thomas on bass and Stuart Pereira and they brought a lot to it you know and and, uh, and there's another song called Is That What You Did which uh, we really built up in this place, Sound Park, is where we recorded. We also rehearsed here and at gigs we just sort of built it up as a long jam that um, just had minimal kind of words. But uh, it, it's, and even when we play it, there's different different ways that it goes. So uh, That has two versions on mm. the record as well because of that. Every time we play it, it's completely different. Mm. Yeah. Normally he just starts stringing out some chords, have a listen. He's normally got an arrangement, doesn't he? Yeah, there's usually an arrangement. I mean, I remember some of these songs he had sent to us with a um, uh, uh, just just chords on a on a twelve string. But I mean, it was it was quite a, a long time ago. But I can't, couldn't make out any of it because um, I hear a twelve string and I just can't hear the changes. So on one of them, I said, "Can you just call, give me that same thing to call out the chords?" <laughs> and then we started building that song, and that was one of them. I did the bass line at home, actually. But yeah, most of the time, he throws it at us. We do up an, an arrangement, and then we we work it out live. You know, yeah, that's what usually happens. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, we're well, in the rehearsal room, and just run through the things a few times and try and find something to hook onto it, just find a part that'll, yeah, that seems to fit in there. That's all there is to it, I guess. Uh, some of the songs uh, were bits and pieces that you would uh, had archived or worked on previously. Uh, how are you at archiving things? Do you, do you know where to find things when you need to? <laughs> archiving. I guess there's a song, Gloria Graham, that we, was another one that we did. I did it all as a kind of one of our monthly single things and... <clears throat> that's on the album in two versions. We started to do it live because I just uh, had this idea that it could sound really good with a slide guitar and approaching it a bit like uh, a Fleetwood Mac, uh, Peter Green era type thing. And uh, Claire and I, I can communicate ideas like that to Claire quite quickly, you know, because that's a specific kind of groove on the drums. And uh, 
uh, and Stu Thomas uh, and Stuart Pereira are very musical too in a in a kind of immediate spontaneous way that the way they uh, react to things. Um, so uh, archiving, I don't know whether I'm so good at it. That's all dependent on technology and uh, everybody's had computers die on them and <laughs> hard drives and we have we have a lot of uh, CDs from the uh, early 2000s which we did digital recordings of and uh, I, I'm afraid to look at them to see what's actually lasted on them, I don't know. Mm, lots of ADATs too, yeah. not A's, sure yes. what's on them. Yeah. <laughs> We have some uh, multi tracks and uh, all that kinds of stuff. Yeah. We send a lot of stuff to uh, sound. What's it called? Screen sound. Yeah, film and sound. Film archive. and sound archive. Yeah. They, and hopefully they're archiving it. <laughs> Otherwise, there's an archive in our brains. I mm. think. Yeah, that might be a that might be the best archive. But uh, mm. yeah. yeah. I uh, <clears throat> just wanted to talk about a few of the songs. Uh, Baby, I wish I'd been a better pop star. Uh, <clears throat> fiction, fact, autobiographical, <laughs> sarcasm, uh, what was your thinking? Um, it's a bit like a country song in a way, and uh, I write a lot of songs with uh, when I think of the song title, and uh, there's a bit of Lee Hazelwood in it, in the way I tried when I was thinking of singing it, and uh, it's in a way it's a, I see it as a conversation I'm saying to Claire you know I blew it baby I screwed up <laughs> you know I, and then it's a funny thing to think about because uh, how can you be a better pop star you know where is the rule book because we've often met uh, people who uh, who behave really unpredictably or badly and uh is that a good pop star? <laughs> yes, it is. Or, you know, do you follow the rules or do you break them? And, uh, and working, if you're working with a large label, um, often it's great if, if you're causing trouble, you get everybody's attention <laughs> and they all want to get in there and, uh, you know, they're all fussing about you. <laughs> so... Uh, Where's the rule book? I don't know. And then there's other people who just, uh, you know, they behave very well and they're, they're really good. And uh, it, it's a, uh, I thought it was an interesting thing to write a song about. And uh, it, 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 the music, the song came together really, really quickly. And uh, again, it's one of those things, I was picking it out on the guitar and I thought it should be small, but then we played it with the band and it just kind of comes out in, in a large chorus. Yeah. Uh, where's my buzz and is that what you did uh, both lengthy songs mm -hmm. seven and eight minutes uh, <clears throat> was this your opportunity to become a jam band <laughs> <laughs> yeah well I love jam bands and uh, by that I mean the greatest ever would be the Allman Brothers or the uh, or Grateful Dead the Grateful Dead mm. on Dark Star but the Allman Brothers certainly on uh Whipping the Post. Whipping Post <laughs> and uh, Mountain Jam from oh. Eater Peach and uh, just the, the general early work with uh, with Dickie Betts and uh, and Dwayne Allman. But uh, it's always an interesting song to do. It's great to do live. And uh, we, uh, we've put out so many records. Uh, people come to our shows if they know our music and, and probably hear a lot of stuff they don't know. And uh, it's been interesting playing that song live because I, I don't know whether it's what people are expecting from us. And Where's My Buzz has so many chords we haven't played it live yet. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's like a chordal, chordal kind of avalanche. <laughs> but uh, I think that's more of a yacht rock kind of uh, approach with the vocals. And Claire and Stuart are great with the uh, experimenting with harmonies in the uh, backing vocals. Well, I reckon we had this residency. It was kind of, it was going to be four weeks and then it got extended to, I don't know, felt like three Thanks. months. <laughs> yeah, a month. And then we, that was a good time to just sort of try out all this stuff. And every week we'd 
we try the new stuff and it get longer and longer and longer. So that that explains why on this album there's some real jam songs, you know. This sort of what what probably they would call Grateful Dead <laughs> sort of jams, but I don't know them. So um, I would just say, you know, jammy. And um, so, yeah, they got kind of pretty wild and, and open-ended, so... Um, that was a good direction. Yeah, that that was quite different from most of the albums, which had been song based. Yeah, that's the thing. But I think with um, whenever you hear something like Dave already plays guitar, so I'm playing guitar as well, and you don't want to put the, the less is more. I think with usually, I know maybe I don't know if it always sounds like that, but you always want to just find something that's not going to get in the way. There's like vocals happening, there's backing vocals, there's all this stuff happening. So you, especially because on an extra guitar, you just want to find something that's going to colour it and maybe bring out another harmony or another melody or or just counterpoint in some way. So, yeah, sometimes it takes a while to find that, in a different rhythm or something. And, uh, yeah, so that's a good thing because Dave's already got something there to work with and you just, in a way, you're trying to problem solve, I guess, just find something that's going to work and, and add something to the song. So uh, Ultra Keith, uh, do you think Keith would improve? <laughs> I don't know, I'm probably a bit scared of him actually <laughs> hearing it. You know, he mightn't, you know. Uh, uh, I, I was very impressed reading Keith's book in some ways. Other ways, this is Keith Richard, yeah. And, um, other ways, you know, I think, wow, you know, he's not very generous to, to Mick, you know. And, uh, I really like Mick Jagger a lot for uh, the pop sensibility and the things he does and he's great, great kind of, there's so much drama in the Rolling Stones. They're very interesting as a band. And uh, it was more personally, we've known so many people who've tried to live up to the badass role that Keith Richard ex established as how you have to behave if you're a musician. We have, we have known so many people who've tried that. And uh, <clears throat> most of them come to a very bad situation you know either they die or they're ill or damage themselves but you know it's somebody said it about johnny thunders you know it's like he he tried to live like daffy duck but uh <laughs> daffy duck always picks up his beak and sticks it back on <laughs> but it doesn't happen like that in real life so uh it's it's an interesting song an interesting area to to for me to think about and it, and it just the song just came out so easily, you know, with uh, all those things. And it's a guy. I was impressed in his book how he said, uh, "I don't eat at, at normal times. I don't sleep at normal times." And, and yet know. he's still alive. Mm. <laughs> and he's like he said, "Fuck you to uh, everything," and uh, and he's consist consistently seemed to do it. And he was lucky enough to have people around him <laughs> who, who put up it. with it, perhaps. <laughs> I don't know, because uh, it's painful to be around people like that. You know, you know I've been around people like that. And it's, it's, they're, they're pains in the ass, really. <laughs> but, uh, Your Masters <clears throat> was mixed by uh, Henry Wagons. Why mm. did you bring Henry on board for that particular song? Uh, well, sometimes I visit Henry Wagons in his uh, home studio and he's he's a real uh, technical kind of uh, geek and his home studio is incredible. His skills as a you know singer are amazing and, and guitar playing, but he's, he's always getting other people to do it, <clears throat> you know, getting other guitar players and, you know, he, he he's, has ideas about doing things properly, you know, and uh, maybe one day he'll just do a record completely on his own but uh i just was talking with him and he said oh i could mix a track and i and i probably annoyingly i got back to him and said yeah okay <laughs> i've got one for you so he kindly did it and he he's really good with uh, all the vocal kind of compression and side chain kinds of things you know i i, I don't really understand how to do Dave, your main guitar was at the Ibanez Talman on this album? Yes, I, I used Ibanez Talman and I have a 12 string. It's a uh, knockoff of a music man, but by, uh, and the brand is OLP. I think it's a Chinese made um, uh, instrument, and I've uh, always been mucking around with it for years. Um, 
12 strings are hard to get a sound out of and uh, I use a pedal called a uh, jangle box which is uh, just specifically for electric 12 string and uh, we, we used it on a uh, there's a song on the album called Your Masters Must Be Pleased With You that, it, that it's used on and that's a song we originally recorded in 1998 but it, in uh, We've started playing it again live and it's really apt for the kind of recent political situation in Australia. And uh, so it ended up uh, sounding really good on, on that track. Uh, electric 12 strings, uh, intoxicating sound. And uh, of course it, it's, uh, it's used uh, for, uh, in, in a way, the birds did it the best and uh, you read about it and it's, Roger McQueen used two compressors going into a desk of his Rickenbacker 12 string, but uh, there's so many uh, different things you have to experiment with, yeah. I bought mine in 1995 when I was just about to join Kim Salmon and the Surrealists, and I had a, I had a Washburn guitar, but it wasn't, um, it was okay, <laughs> but the action was about this high off the the board but I I didn't mind that I got used to it but then um what I used to do is detune the strings but then obviously when I joined Kim he wanted traditional tuning I reckon and also I was looking at a fretless bass but then I, he said no don't don't do it and uh so I a mate of mine was selling his uh Fender and I uh I bought it actually I put a down payment on it and I went on tour to Europe <laughs> and uh I kept sending him some money back and he said, you don't have to keep doing that. I trust you. But I just thought, you know, I've taken off and he, I thought he might think I'm never coming back. But, um, yeah, with the guy, there was a guy called Ewan Cameron who used to play in Melbourne. I don't know where he is now, probably Berlin. But, yeah, I've stuck with that one forevermore, near yeah, that Fender P pace. And the Rickenbacker? The Rickenbacker, I got that in the trading post in like 1996 or something like that. And the time I was playing in this sort of like a funk R&B sort of band and I'd been using a Strat copy, which I got from my uncle who's left-handed as well. And um, yeah, just sort of needed something different. So yeah, trading post back when it was a piece of paper, you know, or it was a newspaper. And and this girl in Fitzroy, she had a few Rickenbackers, I remember, and they were all like brand new, really nice guitars and stuff. And it was amazing and um yeah I just tried it out and was like wow this is great you know um when you're left-handed you don't really get a lot of choice with the guitars anyway so um so i grabbed it and then since then i've tried other guitars um like sort of les paul like ibanez les pauls those lawsuit ones and there's different things that have turned up telecaster type things stratocaster type things but that guitar I don't know it's, it's got a good tone everything seems to be a poor imitation of that it's very uh, versatile uh, it's, a, it's a Rickenbacker 620 apparently because it's solid body and you know it's got a bit of range of the tone and stuff like that oh well I've got my um my beautiful Gretsch kit that I normally use on recording uh that stayed home for this one because I got to use uh, Edge's beautiful Ludwig, um, he was kind enough to uh, offer that to me and I really liked the Ludwig so I thought for a change I'd use that one and I brought along my own cymbals and uh, you know Brady snare and stuff like that. So Claire when you uh, hear the songs for the first time, mm. uh, the, the first percussion ideas, do, do they usually stick or do you like to play around mm. with different ideas and tempos for a while? Uh, well, the, it does change from the drum machine. It depends what drum machine. Da See, Dave often puts down demos on it with it using some kind of drum machine. And sometimes I just want to move completely away from that. Or sometimes I think it sounds really good. But like I was saying before with um, that one song in particular, um, Song of Life, yeah, it sounded, it sounded great when we did it live. A few times and did it a little bit faster and it just sounded a lot more funky <laughs> and there's a lot more movement in it especially you know when you add bass to it as well that just sounded really good so we wanted to do that but, um yeah I don't know I think ch things change more when the band actually gets hold of songs for sure uh, um, and with this album you got to uh, play around with some uh, additional percussion instruments did you enjoy that 
the what like vibraphone. Yeah, I, yeah, I play a lot of vibes actually. I've recorded quite a lot of vibes. We, we've sort of worked out how to do it at home too. Um, I, we normally put that down later on. Um, the most important thing, obviously, is to get the, the drums down, and that's a bit too hard to do at home. I think you need to have a, you know, you need to have more microphones and somebody else <laughs> in a in a control room actually uh, sorting out the sound. And uh, recording the vibes has been a long period of trying to work out how to do it. Mm. It's often the room you're in. Yeah, and you can if. Well, if we're recording the vibraphone by itself, you know, the microphones can be further away. <clears throat> if you have other instruments or any spill at all, the microphones have to be closer and then you, you just get the attack on the the uh, metal, you know, and that's not always what you want. It's sort of, yeah, so it's sort of, or is always best to do it as an overdub later. Where to sit them in a mix is... Uh, mm. is uh... Tricky. Yeah, it's always, or is it something to solve? But we also have a bass. Depends what else is in there, you know. What's the other one, the wooden one you've got? Oh, the it? deep bass xylophone. Yeah, that's that's tricky too, mm. actually, to find a place for it in the mix sometimes. They have to be quite loud, otherwise you kind of just say, yeah, have, they can sound like one of those little thumb piano things or something. Kalimba. Yeah, they... Yeah, so yeah, it's tricky, I'm sure. Some people would know how to do it properly, but mm. <laughs> we seem to be able to work it. Well, we've worked it out now, I think. We've, did, we've done lots of performance mm. with uh, Vibes bass and 12-string over about about 10 years ago. We, we did about a year's worth of shows like that. And yeah, and lots of people will come up, lots of sound people will come up and assume that you've mic'd the vibraphone up underneath which is not the best way to do it because the microphones are usually then too close to the foldback and they just feed back the whole time. And, you know, I've gotten used to playing the vibraphone without having it in the foldback at all because it's an acoustic instrument and it's quite, it's fairly quiet. You know, you just have to uh, try and make sure everything else on stage isn't too loud is the best way to go with it. You seem to have really embraced uh the digital age, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it allows you to do things like have different versions of songs on an album <clears throat> uh, rather than just being given money by a record company to do one specific thing. Mm -hmm. Are you enjoying that aspect of...? It's quite good. Uh, Claire and I have experienced a lot of different uh, periods in uh, in the mus being musicians and we have worked with a major record label in the 90s and we really enjoyed it. Uh, we meet lots of uh, young musicians and they have this way about them that, you know, they really want to hold on to things and have control. And uh, we've experienced uh, working with uh, an organisation where lots of people come in and want to get their hands on things. And, and, uh, and uh, so we've experienced it in reality and it was really enjoyable. And also having the thing where you've got a producer who... Mm. Uh, some producers who you have a lot of faith in and you don't mind handing over the reins to them completely mm. as well. We've had that experience, which is really great too, because mm. they bring a lot to it. Early on, we worked with Barry Adamson in that in that role, and he was more of a peer and a friend. He's a great musician, but he's also a great kind of begin. Uh, that was at the beginning of his solo career. A great. Uh, uh, kind of visionary of sound and uh, arrangement. We worked with Victor Van Vute on the Soft and Sexy Sound, a brilliant uh, producer, uh, kind of, and a great character, but again, a very personal relationship. He was an old friend of ours and worked with us in The Moodists and worked with Phil Vinyl, an Englishman, on uh, My Life on the Plains, and I was the hunter and I was the prey. A great, great experience working with him. And uh, Tony Cohen, of course, on uh, Night of the Wolverine, and uh, you want to be there, but you don't want to travel. Um, oh, enjoyed working with all of them. Yeah, Tony was, you know, a unique character, not so much of a producer, but uh, he, he certainly got... Um, he, he just was had so many old-school skills that, um, that were incredible and uh, 
he was a great character in, in his own way, you know, but, but not a producer as such. Uh, he really, he, in a way, let the band be themselves uh, more than anything. But we can do it. We do do a lot of stuff ourselves mm. at home now, but we still enjoy going to into a studio, uh, putting down the drums first, and and uh, yeah, ba- or or everything at, at once, mm. <laughs> as long as the drums are there. Mm. <laughs> You've played with Dave for quite a while now. Uh, you have your own favourite Dave stories. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's just a it's just a long it's just a long time. You can't, can't pinpoint anything, you know what I mean? It's like, uh, I just like how um, how he uh, approaches a live, basically, it's just in general, just a live situation. And when people think they know what's going on, he throws them for a six. You know? <laughs> and he'll say, he'll just say stuff that he probably doesn't mean. And then um, <laughs> they... Uh, you know, just to see what that, what's going to happen, and um, and then he'll keep doing that, and he'll keep doing it. It's like um, certain comedians will keep making you feel a little bit uncomfortable, and they never really get to a point, and then we'll just play. You know, <laughs> so he's lucky because a lot of comedians they don't have that sort of um, fallback where they can do a song, and and um, after you know ease all that tension. But um, yeah, he's very, very good at sort of. Um, I don't know, you know, just like, like, you know, I don't know. There's nothing beyond that. I, I don't want to talk about outside of the stage because, I, on the whole, can't really remember it all. But <laughs> yeah, and yeah, in live performance situations, he's completely unflappable. Doesn't matter whether the audience is, you know, thousands of people or if it's, a, it's a three people there, he'll always find a way to connect with what's going on and doesn't matter what turns up he'll yeah he's always got his own spin on it and nothing seems to throw him uh you've got some dates coming up national dates uh then <clears throat> what's on for the second half of the year well we have a vague plan to put out another album later in the year and claire and i have recorded uh, kind of continuing more of the songs just doing it uh the two of us and we, we've uh the songs that didn't make this album and uh we're pretty much done about 10 songs uh, so far. Um, just got a, a couple more to, to put down after we do some dates. So we might put out uh, this, this other one later in the year. Maybe it'll be next year, I don't know. But. And uh, zip de doo uh, how do people buy it? Uh, our only really uh, contact with music business, I guess, is through our, our agent, uh, booking agents, and... Uh, and uh, the Orchard, which is a digital a distributor, and so so we just have our music out uh, digitally, and we manufacture compact discs, which we uh, sell at our gigs, and we, we just go around to a few shops, you know, uh, you know, shops that we we like in Melbourne, Sydney, uh, Brisbane, Adelaide, and Perth, and otherwise people buy it through through our website for a mail order. But uh, we, we we haven't ever manufactured any vinyl. Just trying to avoid the vinyl <laughs> kind of. Uh, I don't know what it is. It's like craft beer. I don't I don't really understand it. <laughs> beer is supposed to be something you can get really wasted on uh, twenty dollars, <laughs> as far as I can understand. And but twenty dollars is what one beer costs. All of a sudden, I don't, I don't understand it. Vinyl is the same as craft beer to me. Devin Clay, thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you.